And it's a pleasure to be here with you today to share information about family promise, community organizing, direct service, and public policy advocacy. I certainly had no idea almost 25 years ago that giving a sandwich to a homeless woman in New York City outside the steps of Grand Central Station would lead to the founding of an organization. But I can tell you with three things, passion, persistence, and good strategy, many things are possible. I'll share a little bit about the founding of the organization because I don't come to this position having a master's in public administration or public service. I certainly have a heart in that and have had a heart in that for some time. But as Julie mentioned, at the time I was in corporate America. I was marketing Schick razors and blades and Listerman mouthwash, developing consumer promotions, sweepstakes and couponing events to move product off the shelf. I was very happy. I was successful and I was looking for the next promotion. But somewhere deep in my heart, I had that yearning for service. You see, as a high school student, I regularly volunteered. When I got married, we had people who were young girls who were in reform school over at our house for the holidays and people who were in need. But that service work was very much a volunteer activity until one day I was going into New York to meet with our advertising agency. This was in the early 80s and I was about to pass Grand Central Station, um, about to pass a woman in front of Grand Central Station who I had passed before, who was homeless, who sat on a crate with all her belongings be, uh, around her. And on impulse I ran across the street and got her a sandwich just to drop it and run. But as I gave her the sandwich, she took my hand, I learned about Millie's life, and as I went back a few years, she had been married, she had been hospitalized, she had been deinstitutionalized, and so on, but she was somebody's mother, somebody's wife, she had a life. But because she was off her medications and, and, and homeless, she was in front of um, Grand Central Station. Her response and her sharing her story with me motivated me to tell my two sons who were then 10 and 12 about Millie. And they said, well, mom, let's go back into New York with more sandwiches. You see, I don't know if you recall, but homelessness, the word homeless was not in our vocabulary until about the mid 80s. Um, but now it was a hard to walk a city block without seeing somebody who was obviously homeless. So we began bringing sandwiches into New York city for to people who were homeless actually to port authority bus terminal where we saw that people gathered they actually slept in the basement and would come up and and sit on the benches in um in, in port authority bus terminal so every other sunday we would do that and bring the sandwiches and the sandwiches were really a vehicle to get to know folks and say hello and they waited for us but little did i know that that was really the tip of the iceberg that for every one for every, uh, for every one person I saw, there were another 20 I didn't see. And I didn't recognize a mom pushing a stroller with a five-year-old by her side. I didn't understand family homelessness. I then turned to my own state in New Jersey and began attending Governor Kane's task force meetings on family homelessness. This was in 1983. And I learned at that time that families were the fastest growing segment of the homeless population and at that time the number one reason the kids were taken from their parents and placed in foster care was not abuse or neglect it was simply homelessness in other words if you're a good parent but you can't put a roof over your children's head your kids could be taken away and I thought wow does the community know because you certainly don't see homeless families around you don't see homeless families around for good reason because they're sleeping in their car behind Walmart and behind churches they're doubling and tripling up and maybe they're in shelters if they can find shelters or they're staying in inexpensive welfare motels or, or cheap motels until their until their money r runs out so I thought I wonder if the religious community knew would they want to get involved and I say the religious community because I was looking for a group that had a mandate to serve, right? And certainly the religious community has a mandate to serve. But I didn't want to invite any one denomination. I wanted to invite all faiths because I believe whether you're Muslim, Christian, or Jew, we all have a mandate for service. So I planned an interfaith conference inviting a target group, if you will, that had a mandate to serve to hear 
not about Millie, who I met in front of Grand Central Station, or Abe, who was a regular in Port Authority, but to hear about family homelessness. 200 people came to that all-day conference in October 1985 to hear about family homelessness. People cared. They wanted to make a difference. I was encouraged. I'm equally encouraged, and even more so, with now 135,000 volunteers from 5,000 congregations involved. So we had the conference. Conferences are nice, but they're only effective if there's a plan of action. So I knew I wanted to keep up the momentum. So I began having regular meetings with whoever wanted to show up. We met every two weeks. 20 to 30 people showed up at Christ Church in Summit, New Jersey, our meeting place. We were looking for a building to renovate, a building to buy, but there was much red tape. Nobody wanted a homeless shelter in their backyard and it was going to be expensive. Not one church or synagogue could be a full-time shelter, but we soon realized, what if we all worked together? Maybe we could do together what we couldn't do alone. So 10 churches and one synagogue came forward and agreed to provide hospitality. Hospitality is an important word because we knew it wasn't just going to be about shelter, it was going to be relationship with the religious community. So we called it Interfaith Hospitality Network. It opened its doors in October of 1986. And I'd have to say when we opened our doors, it was about providing basic shelter and meals because you see the other shelters in the community were not only turning families away but both of the but one of those shelters in Elizabeth it was goodbye God bless you at 7:30 in the morning and whether you were an able-bodied 30 year old male or a pregnant 27 year old female you had to walk and then you, you, you had to walk all day and came back come back and line up to see if you had a bed we knew that we didn't want to do that so the word hospitality was very important but we also had to find a day center for families during the day. Now this is very important because there's five components that exist in every, every community and we mobilized existing resources. We didn't build or renovate a building. We didn't hire an extensive staff. We mobilized what exists. We tapped the mandate of the faith community and, and the, the generous spirit of Americans. We mobilized five community resources. Houses of worship that actually have quite a bit of space especially during the week. Not one could be a full-time shelter, but again, it's something a congregation could do four times a year. Houses of worship, a space for a day center for families, and I don't mean a drop-in center that you'll find in major cities where people who are homeless just come and gather. This was a special dedicated space for families where they would have a dress, they would have showers, they could, um, it was a home base for them as they looked for housing and jobs. So the Y provided space for a day center. Social service agencies were all too glad to refer families. Autoland discounted a van because we needed transportation for families from the day center to the host congregation. And to my surprise, hundreds of volunteers came out. Now, bringing your children into New York to give sandwiches to the homeless in New York City is not for everyone, right? But if you do say to folks, help homeless families and you talk about families like them that are struggling and you make it easy for folks to get involved. We weren't asking them to drive 20 miles to a shelter to get involved. We were saying come back to your own community, to your own house of worship. Prepare a meal, stay overnight, volunteers with, with your children. So that's how so many volunteers get involved, typically 800 or more in a particular program. So it started out as a basic shelter program. But what I saw as a hallmark then, that first week in October of 1986, is true today, having served more than 350,000 people. And it's simply, it's, it's, it's simply this. Yes, close to 80% find housing in nine, in nine weeks, but there's something else. It was Maria and her 12-year-old daughter, Nicole, that stayed at the first host congregation, Christ Church. And the week runs from Sunday to Sunday. So Sunday afternoon, the families leave and the van comes. 
So after that very first host week when everybody was very nervous, um, the volunteers more so than the, the families, um, the van pulled up and the families were packing up their things to go to the next church, the Methodist church. And little Nicole, who had befriended the coordinator of the program, um, Isabel Devaney, they became fast friends during that week, and also with her mother, Maria. As Nicole went to get on the van, um, she came running back because she realized it was the last time she would see her friend, Isabel Devaney, the quarter, coordinator, and she came running back up to her, and she gave her a big hug, and she said, Miss Devaney, I'm leaving now to go to the next church. She said, but I want you to know, I want you to know that Christ Church will always be my home. What she was saying is, I felt at home. You treated me like family. You cared for me. And that's one of the hallmarks. Yes, ending homelessness, first and foremost, is about producing enough affordable housing that people can spend a third of their income on housing. It's about jobs that provide a living wage. But it's also about healing the hurt of homelessness. Because when, when you heal the hurt of homelessness and you're in a caring environment, families feel good about who they are. And that's one of the hallmarks of Family Promise. When I spoke with George at our Dalton affiliate, Last week, when I met with Dalton George, I met with him um, at the day center. George is a volunteer at, at our Dalton affiliate. Um, but he came up to me and he said, Karen, I can't thank you enough. He was really thanking all the volunteers for starting Family Promise. It changed my life. Now, George didn't say, thank you for the wonderful home-cooked meals or the safe place to stay. He began to talk about the very volunteers involved. He talked about Nancy, an RN from that affiliate, who worked very closely with his wife, encouraging her all the way to get her LPN. And now that she's out of the program, they're still working together, working on her RN. Well, Jasmine never had that support in her family. Lo and behold, she became homeless. And yes, it's about shelter and getting on your way and finding housing. But that context allowed the opportunity for a relationship for Nancy to get to know Jasmine. And how valuable is that? And Jasmine now is realizing her dream of becoming a registered nurse and has a mentor. This happened because the two were allowed to meet. Or let's look at George. George grew up in a very, very unhappy home. He would leave right after school and go out into the woods where he had a tree, tree hut. He lived with an abusive family life. And he said he would go up in that tree hut and he would dream of a better day and dream of having kids of his own. And he learned carpentry skills as he built that tree hut. He was in the program and uh, he had been working for a carpet company uh, that downsized and he lost his job, but he had these carpentry skills. And he met Eric, who had an air conditioning and heating business, and Eric said, you want a home repair business, a carpentry business? Let's work together. So he helped him form that business. And not surprisingly, many of the volunteers are his clients. The point I'm making and the real value behind Family Promise is the opportunity to engage folks. 135,000 people, I think you would agree, is a large number. How does it happen? Because they're allowed to work locally. And while the program itself is a success, the relationships that are formed change lives. So when I met George at that day center, it was, I, had gen I mean, Family Promise changed my life. I got to tell you, Family Promise didn't change his life. He changed his life. But caring people in the community, like you and you and you and you, changed his life. What Family Promise does very well, we provide the system and the structure to engage people. It's not the Family Promise program, it's the method we employed. Now, I'd love to tell you that almost 25 years ago, I sat down with this master plan and said, we've got to engage Americans across this country. There's not enough people that care about poverty, and I'm going to develop a strategy that effectively engages people in local communities. No, my initial goal was to provide the shelter and the meals. But now hindsight, almost 25 years later, I look back and I say, here are the outcomes. Close to 80% find housing 
in uh, just nine weeks. We have a recidivism rate that is lower than 5%. More than 700 partnerships and community initiatives have developed, again, not by family promise, but people who sit in their own houses of worship and hear about a mom who says, our money ran out, we had no place to stay, we were staying in, 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 a, in, a, in a motel, and we ended up staying in our car, parked behind the church. We were ashamed. It was myself and my husband and my two, two children. We were down to 97 cents. 97 cents will buy you Vienna, Vienna sausages, which my one and a half year old daughter loves. And we stayed there for three weeks before we found family promise. No family in America should have to live in their car behind a church or Walmart or a government agency or anywhere. It shouldn't happen. But once you engage local communities, solutions are found. More than 700 community initiatives have been developed that include housing. We operate 500 units of housing, our affiliates do. Financial literacy programs, parenting, health care, and child care. And child care in, in Augusta, they have a child care program for all homeless children in Augusta. Why? Because Gary Billingsley, a pediatrician, got involved in his own church and he said, how do we expect these families to find housing and jobs if there's no affordable child care? We didn't develop the child care program. Our local affiliate didn't develop it. Gary Billingsley developed it because he got involved. Uh, so as I was saying, once you involve local communities, other initiatives develop. And so currently we have more than 700 partnerships and initiatives that have gotten involved. I also believe, as uh, Reverend William Sloan Coffin used to say, that charity and justice are not mutually exclusive. In fact, I personally feel that I have an obligation with 135,000 volunteers who rock babies, who prepare meals, who stay overnight, who write resumes, who set up the beds, who do the laundries, who give hugs, um, that we have a responsibility to engage some of those volunteers, those volunteers who want to, in public policy issues, that direct service and the engagement of communities Oh, this is quite something. Um, uh, that we have a responsibility for public policy. And now I'm, I'm look, going back to the group that I told you I originally called on, the faith community. Well, any faith community has a mandate for service and justice. So about eight years ago, we developed, with the support of the Ford Foundation, a program called Just Neighbors, which is a multimedia interactive curriculum on poverty. It's designed to educate our volunteers about why the families are in our churches in the first place. It, uh, in a very interactive way, engages people on what it costs to afford housing and what happens if you're working as a, nur uh, as a um, nurse's aide or a truck driver or a cashier. How do you afford housing? How do you afford health care? How do you afford child care? And as you begin to balance that budget, you see it's a near impossibility to be able to afford housing um, at about a third of your income. In fact, there's no state in the country that allows someone who's working minimum wage to afford the fair market two-bedroom rental. I mean, this is important. Homelessness, solving homelessness is about engaging volunteers, but don't get me wrong, that is not the solution. The solution to homelessness in this country is sound public policy and a housing policy that helps ensure all families have a decent and affordable place to call home. So it stands to reason that with 135,000 volunteers, you don't want to be deemed as a solution to homelessness. Potentially, I think we are. If, if folks across the country not only combine the direct service with work with homeless and low-income families, but also some of them get involved in, in, in policy work. In fact, legislators said, what we like about you, we see a group of people that we normally don't see. We see lobbyists, we see some people from the community in need, um, um, but we rarely see you know, volunteers. So that's an important voice that we bring. I'd like to tell you um, that it, it's a glowing success. It's not as easy to get folks involved in public policy work. Why? Because there's immediate rewards when you prepare a meal and you bring it into your church and the family sit down with you and say, whoa, this casserole is so good and look at this dessert, instant reward. Or there's a fussy 
two-year-old and you, you take her over here and you read her a story, you play a game, there's a smile on her face, or a mom asks you to hold her, 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 her newborn and you do that instant, rewards, feel so good, and, and volunteering should be about feeling good. Less immediately rewarding when you're going to meet with your legislator or you're going to send an email in support of legislation. You wonder if you're going to make a difference. So we have a program called Voices Uniting where we equip those congregations and volunteers who want to be involved in public policy. We've been involved in helping to reshape the definition of uh, family homelessness because there's an awful lot of families that don't count as homeless. You know, if you're doubled or tripled up, you don't count as being homeless. Um, We've also worked on um, housing policy and helped support the National Housing Trust Fund. Um, there's 30 million, we have a 30 million unit shortfall of affordable housing and the Housing Trust Fund would help create housing each year, but right now there is no funding for that. I mean, President Obama does have a billion dollars in his budget, but lots of advocacy and I don't know what else has to happen to get that funded. Nevertheless, it's very, very important to continue, I believe, to communicate this to groups. I worry sometimes, as wonderful as organizations are that involve so many volunteers, we can never be seen as a replacement for public policy. So I'm a big believer that direct service should lead to public policy. Now let's go back a few minutes to when I started this talk and I said I was motivated to create a shelter and you know there was a roadblock and so I got folks together and this is what we came up with. But let's now look back at that and say, oh, what Family Promise is about, it's about shelter but mostly it's a community engagement model. I get it. They tap a group that has a mandate to help the faith community. They make it easy for them to get involved. They don't ask them to drive 10 or 15 miles. They bring homeless families to their own house of worship and get them involved. Once they sit around a table like that and hear the stories of family members struggling on little money, a low paying service jobs at hours reduced with no health care or no child care or dad that's very, very disappointed because he's been looking for housing for three months and the Section 8 uh, certificate waiting list is, is closed um, and there's no affordable housing, that motivates people to get involved because you're giving them the experience. Now homelessness is no longer a headline, well, it doesn't make the headlines anymore, but no longer an article in the, in the news. It's not, a, a, it's not a, a sermon on Sunday or a prayer on Sunday or walking by someone where you wish you could make a difference and do something. These are real people you've come to know. So Family Promise today involves, as I said, 135,000 volunteers, 164 affiliates. We have another th uh, 30 in development. Um, we, last year we served 49,000 people. Uh, almost two-thirds of them were at-risk families because we helped to prevent uh, um, homelessness through our, through our mentoring program and referral to other programs and about a th uh, close to a third of them were homeless. Um, and so our business, really, the business family promises in not the shelter business. It's about engaging communities in direct service, community development, and public policy. And that's, that's pretty much our model through focusing on an initial singular need, family homelessness, a target group, forgive me <laughs> for those from the religious community to call you a target group, but a target group, people who have a mandate to help. Now see, I'm using some of my marketing, no longer marketing Schick razors and blades and Listermit mouthwash to consumers. I am marketing family homelessness to the religious community. And here's the other part, just like in any marketing principle, you have to fulfill a need. And oh boy, let me tell you a little bit about that need, about people in pews who say, I go to church or I go to synagogue, but I want to live out my faith. I want to do, I want to, just don't want to do red canned goods and clothing or write checks. I'll continue to do that, but I want to touch somebody's lives. I want to make a difference. So we're not only for helping to fill a need for homeless families, we're fulfilling a need for people in sitting in congregations who say, I want to make a difference. And by the way, about 10% of our volunteers are unaffiliated you know, with any congregation. You don't have to be a member of a congregation to get involved, but, um, um, and, 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 and many others do. But it's all about focusing 
on a need, target audience, um, and then focusing on the outcomes that you know you, you seek to achieve. So that's pretty much Family Promise in a nutshell. I'm delighted to be in Little Rock because our uh, affiliate here that used to be called IHN is now um, open. Um, Family Promise of Pulaski County. And by the way, we changed our name because the issue we're dealing with is not homelessness. Homelessness is just a symptom, symptom of a deeper issue, and the issue is poverty. So when we say family promise, we're saying our promise is to help ensure that all families have a decent, affordable place to go home, jobs that pay a living wage, health care, child care. It also says that families have so much promise and potential if given the right help at the right time. And so that's the reason we've changed our name to continue to work with communities nationwide. So thank you all for, for listening, and um, I don't know if you have any questions at this, at this time. Yes? One second. Let's get a microphone to you. Let me ask a follow-up question to what I was able to raise uh, in the intermission and uh, what you said on public policy. There are, in addition to the Family Promise Network in Little Rock, there are a number of organizations and coalitions that provide services to the homeless. I'm thinking particularly of those that provide breakfast and lunch. But they're among the various coalitions are considerable uh, agitation that there needs to be public participation in the city of Little Rock dealing with homelessness is, I think, is part of the, the topic you're addressing. What, in your experience, has been useful in involving municipal governments, particularly in doing a fair share in dealing with homelessness? You mean working with city councils? Yes, and uh -huh. getting the city to do, for example, and most of the people in this room know, but you don't, City of Little Rock, about eight years ago, uh, adopted a 10-year plan of dealing with homelessness, yes, uh -huh. which uh, called for creation of a day resource center to provide services including counseling, showers, lots of other things to the homeless. <laughs> that was adopted about eight years ago to be an operation in a year. It has not been. It's been pushed off year by year. Do you have a suggestion of how we in this room could uh, uh, move that to fruition in the current year rather than another three or five years down the way. Okay. Well, thank you for that question. Not knowing your local community, it might be a little difficult for me to respond specifically. I do know that more than 300 communities across the country have developed 10-year plans as part of their continuum of care, and it's very good. Ten-year plans are good in the continuum because it gets people sitting around the table, both the public sector and the private sector, and in many communities, um, you know, efforts have been accomplished. I'm not sure what the particular roadblocks are here. I do know that through our affiliates, one of the ways we have worked is that oftentimes legislators are members of various congregations, so that has given us entree to meet with legislators and our volunteers. Again, it's tapping our network of volunteers. Each affiliate has more than 800 volunteers. Now those 800 volunteers have contacts, so that personal contact helps tremendously. And um, so that, that's a particular strategy that we use, working through our volunteers to meet with our legislators and inviting our legislators back into our host congregations to meet one-on-one -on -one with families and to hear from families. It can be very motivational. I'm sorry, I don't have a direct answer to your question. Yes. I have sort of a follow-up question. Sound public policy. I mean, you mentioned Maybe you can give us an example of affiliate that has had success involving various groups. And if you don't mind, uh, could you give us the uh, facts and the myths about the causes of homelessness? Sure. Okay. okay. Thank you. Well, one example that comes to mind is um, our affiliate in Philadelphia and BART. The, the transportation system was about to dramatically raise the rates on um, public transportation. 
the fair, which was going to really impede low-income families' ability to get to and from work. And so our affiliates in Philadelphia created busloads of volunteers and families and went to Harrisburg and, and testified. And through not just their efforts, but I'm sure other efforts as well, the rates were not raised at that time. Um, the myths about homelessness, that amazes me because even, you know, very, very well educated people want to think, well, if they just tried harder or if they changed their behavior and bad behavior or bad choices are universal no matter uh, what income bracket you're in. And, you know, I, I think people believe that the homeless are all those people that you see on the streets. And certainly the people that are on the streets need our help because many of them are mentally ill and drug addicted. In terms of family homelessness, while there's substance abuse, and that's a factor, um, many homeless families have at least one family member working full or part-time. And the root cause of homelessness, as I mentioned, is the gap between, there's many precipitating causes. It may be an illness, it might be a divorce, a de uh, death of a loved one, loss of a job, all those things happen in all socioeconomic groups, right, in different households. But the root cause is the cost of housing and one's income. So if you're working, if you're a single mom with two kids and you're working as, you know, a, a nurse's aide and you're making just nine fifty an hour, how do you afford a rent where you can pay about a third of your income on the rent and then be able to put food on the table, take your kids to the doctor, repair your car or whatever, it just doesn't add up. And you can be a great mom and doing everything you need to do, but the, de the, the deck is stacked against you. And that's where we need policy to either create the supply of affordable housing or somehow raise one's income or provide the support so that a, a family can stay housed. And, uh, you know, there are too many families um, that are precariously housed. Yes, yes ma'am. My husband and I are veterans, and uh, I can tell you coming back, the people, I'd say. Uh, 50, can you 50, speak up a bit? I'm so sorry. I didn't 50 hear your first words. Maybe units are, are the same case, homelessness. And I want to know what you guys are working with um, Veterans Association across the United States. Do you have any programs that are helping local veterans in main cities? Um, about about two percent. We just have some stats. About two percent of those we served last year um, are veterans. But we don't focus on veterans per se. Um, and I think that two percent is an undercount. But a number of the families we we do serve are veterans. I don't know if there's anyone in the audience that can comment on that. I don't feel well equipped to. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Right yes. Here. I just wanted to say thank you. My name is Rachel White, and I'm an RN. I work for Baptist Medical Center, and we sponsor a um, wellness center each Friday down at the Presbyterian Church. And on Fridays, I do see the homeless. And um, through that program, we have a doctor that comes once a month. Some of them have been able to uh, obtain their social security disability and now have housing and are able to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say that because I think it's a very good cause. And people don't realize, like you said, how many people there really is. Right. And I get different ones weekly. Mm -hmm. and, and families are more apt to qual qualify for housing if they have their disability. Uh, thank you for being here today. I just wondered if you could talk about some of the specific services that are going to be offered at the local affiliate here and uh, what religious groups you're working with in okay. Little Rock. Well, uh, I'll, I'll just nationally um, quickly and then I'll turn it over to Sherry Coote who were, is the board chair of our Little Rock affiliate. Um, you, you asked me what... What services and what faith organizations? Oh, all faith organizations. Well, we virtually work with virtually all faiths because we are 
um, interfaiths, and we have Muslims, Christians, Jews, Sikhs, Baha'is, Hindus. It's it's really wonderful working all together, all over all over the country. In terms of the specific services of sure. um, Family Promise of Pulaski County, I'd ask Sherry Coote to speak. Sherry Coote is the board chair of your Little Rock affiliate. Right now, we have 21 congregations in our network. Uh, we started. We actually opened in the fall, the late fall of 2005, and in the spring, well, in the summer of 2010, we ran out of money. And so we have been on hiatus for 10 months, and we reopened yesterday, serving a wonderful family, just one at the moment, but, you know, that'll, as word gets out to our referring agencies, our executive director is making contacts as we sit here in this lovely uh, facility uh, to make sure that our referring agencies are aware that we're open again. Um, of those 21 congregations, 13 actually house homeless families in their church, in their house of worship. Uh, six of them are what we call partner, partner congregations. They may not have the room to house families, but they have volunteers who love to cook, who might want to spend a night, and so they partner with one of the other congregations. And it's actually some of our smaller congregations have room, but they don't have the volunteers, so the partnerships work great. And then we have two support congregations that uh, have neither the volunteers nor the um, uh, house, the housing uh, room, but they help by writing a check and uh, have been so faithful or, or helping with fundraising events or uh, things of that nature. We have all, at this point, all of our uh, congregations are pretty much mainline congregations. We would love to have uh, anyone. We are making presentations all the time, and I hope that you will call us if you think that your congregation might be interested in getting involved. It is so easy to get involved. And I want to tell you that one of the best ways to do that is to give us a call and then go to one of the congregations that to the congregation that's hosting that week and see the program in action. Sit down and share a meal. Well, that there's always more food than you know, what do what, what are some of the things churches do extremely well? I mean, cook is really one of them. So there's always plenty of food, so come and, and share a meal with the volunteers and the families. And chances are, when you walk in, you might not be able to tell who's homeless and who's housed. There's really very little difference between us. We all love our children. We want what's best for our families. We have a lot in common. We're no longer those people and us. We're just having a meal together, sharing a night, shooting some hoops. You know, I may be over the hill, but I'm a volley, I'm a wiffle ball player, so I love to get the kids out in the parking lot and play wiffle ball. They haven't even heard of wiffle ball, most of them, but uh, I don't even think I answered the question, but I wanted to put in a plug for Family Promise of Pulaski County and um, I want you to get involved. I want you to experience a, a little a guy named Rainer who, when he was moving from one congregation to the next, he, he stopped at the, the door on moving morning and, and looked around and he said, I never had any grandparents before and now I have like 20. <laughs> so you can experience that too. What kind of... Uh, uh, the family promise phone number is three, darn, wait, I know where it is, it's in my phone. I can give you mine, let me just give you mine. Okay, 258-2091 is mine, and I'm going to give you Cynthia as our executive directors in one second because really she's better at this than I am. Okay, her name is Cynthia Ramey 
and her number is 350-6502. That's the family promise number for right now. It's a cell phone. We're moving our uh, offices so the office phone doesn't get moved till May 4th. But that's the cell, her, the, her cell phone. Well, Kaylin, thank you so much for coming in today. And Jerry and Judy, thank you all for uh, helping bring this to our attention. Um, and to stay in touch with everyone, and, and, and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.